First John chapter 4, we're going to continue in our series, really the whole book of First John, the epistle, is about fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And what that constitutes, John wrote it distinctly to attack, or to address rather, heresies and false teachings that had arisen from a group that was in the church, but had separated themselves from the church through understanding that they say they had received enlightenment teaching is contrary to the truth. And so John, as we've been peeling through this epistle, has been combating that false teaching and those false teachers that have perpetuated this false gospel. As we've come to chapter 4, distinctly to verse 7, John has picked back up the concept of love. And as we continue to dig into 1 John 4, John makes the point that we're not to think of love only as constituting God's eternal being and as historically manifested in the sending of Christ into the world. That's not the only way we as believers are to think about agape, which agape in the Greek, it was a term out of all the terms that were used for love. The New Testament writers found this really kind of obscure term that meant love in the Greek. It wasn't used much, and so they took that term to speak of God's love, agape. And John is saying that we are not to look and just think of God's love just as his eternal being and nature or just that it was manifested in our history through the giving of his son because God, who is love and has loved, still loves, right? I know that's a lot of love in there, right? (laughs) But, you know, as the old song says, all we need is love. But just make sure it's the right kind of love. It's got to be God's love. That's all we need is his love. But the God who is love and has love, he still loves. And today, that love is seen in and through the way that we as his children love. God has enabled us and called us to manifest the nature of his love in the world, especially in the body of Christ. John has already written in chapter 4 that we are to love each other. And then he states reasons for this. First, we are to love one another because God is love. Now, we've already looked at that. If we claim to have fellowship with God which this whole epistle is about having fellowship with our Heavenly Father, then we should reciprocate His nature. Like we accuse individuals, uh, maybe wives uh, accuse their children of acting just like their father. (laughs) Maybe it's not a compliment at that moment. (laughs) But as believers, we should reciprocate the nature of our Heavenly Father. 1 John 4, 8 The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So the first reason that we are given to love one another is that in doing so, we manifest the nature of our Heavenly Father. Well, in this chapter, John moves on and says, secondly, we are to love each other because God has loved us. God is love, yes, that's first and foremost, But he has loved us. It is his love that enables and motivates our love. 1 John 4, 9, 10, and 11. By this, the love of God was revealed to us, that God has sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the payment Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
So he gives these two reasons in chapter 4 of why we should love one another, because that's God's nature. And not only is it his nature, but it's the way he's loved us. And we talked about that love. And just in its application, when we looked at verses 7 through 11 last Wednesday, and, and how that God's love is visual, right? It's visual in that his love was manifested through his son. His love is sacrificial. That was manifested through Jesus dying on the cross. And not only that, but his love leads us toward inconvenience. It wasn't convenient for God to be born in a manger, was it? Was it convenient for God to put on flesh like ours and suffer and go through the things that he went through so that he could be our faithful high priest to fully identify with us? No. Was it convenient for him to be beaten in the way that he was beaten and nailed to that cross? Was it anything convenient about God's love, was there? So our love, if it's like God's love, is to be visual, sacrificial, and it leads us to inconvenience because it's greater than self. God loved us before we loved him. And the last of all of the reasons that John gives in chapter 4 for us to love one another is based on God's present and continuous activity of love. If we do indeed love one another as we should, it is proof that God lives in us and his love has been made complete in us. Now before we get to verse 12, which really kicks off the next part that we're going to look at, I just want to remind you that to help us fully understand what defines and inspires our love, God's kind of love, John in these verses, verses 7 through 21, he answers a few questions, two of which we answered last Wednesday. What is the connection between love and God? Verses 7 and 8 speak of that. God is love. He defines love. Love doesn't define God. God defines love. And not only does he answer that question to help define and inspire our love, God's type of love, he also poses the question, what is the basis of our love for each other that he speaks of in verses 9 through 11, which the basis for our love is that God has loved us. And we're to love in the same way. I've said this statement many times, but, but I, I find it so true and encouraging in my own life. God never asks of us what he hasn't already done. He's provided that example. He's already gone there, and then he asks us to follow him. And the final question that we're going to look at tonight, Lord willing, and next Wednesday night, is what effects show up in the lives of individuals who exhibit God's kind of love. John begins to answer that in verse 12 of chapter 4. No one has ever seen God, John says. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray. Father, just open our hearts. Lord, we humbly pray to receive your truth. Help us through your Holy Spirit to rightly divide your truth so that we may rightly apply it and live it out for your glory and for the testimony of the gospel of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No one has ever seen God. So John points this out. Now, we know at the very beginning he started his letter out by saying we have seen the manifestation of God. The greatest theocracy, if you wanted to state it that way, came through Christ. Philip says, you know, it would be enough, Jesus, if you will just show us the Father. We're good. Remember, Philip asked that question as they were making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was going to be, Jesus would be betrayed by Judas. And Jesus says, have I... Not been with you long enough that you understand, Philip, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But notice, John, what he is speaking of here. No one has ever seen God. But John has highlighted this also in his gospel account, hasn't he? 
John 1 verse 18, John stated it this way. No one has seen God at any time. God, the only Son, who is in the arms of the Father, he has explained him. Or John 5, 37, Jesus states, And the Father who sent me, he has testified about me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. In John 6, 46, Jesus also stated, Not, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God, He has seen the Father. So physically laying our eyes upon the full manifestation of who God is in his full glory. We can't stand that. Now we saw God in the flesh, right? He was fully God. The full manifestation of who God is, his character. Who he is in the person of Christ. But for us to behold the glory of God. In fact, Moses Lord, I want to see your glory. What did God say? You can't. So I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to pass by, and what you're going to see is basically the remnant of my glory. And that was more than Moses could really handle. But here, John states that the invisible nature of who God is because we can't handle the full manifestation of his glory, he reproduces the statement that he spoke of in his gospel account in John 1.18 with only minor variations. And John's point is that while no one can claim to have seen God apart from God's one and only Son, John's point is believers who love one another, they demonstrate that God who is unseen lives in them. In fact, when we get down to verse 20, probably is already the verse has already popped in your mind, maybe you've already looked in it or looked at it, that John even rehearses, how can you say you love somebody that you can set eyes on and say that you can love God who you haven't seen? You can't. You can't. And so what John is saying here is that although we have not physically set our eyes upon the glory of God, who he is, his manifestation physically, if we have his love in our hearts that we are expressing to one another, then we testify that God is within us. It's proof that we know and we have fellowship with God. Reciprocal Christian love means not only that God lives in us, but also that his love is made complete in us. And that's an important statement in this verse. And his love is perfected in us. Perfected. I love what John says here. Although we haven't seen, if we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. And we know God's love, which originated In himself, because we've already read that in verse 7 and 8 of chapter 4, it was manifested through his son, verses 9 and 10, and it is made complete in us, his people, his children. And it is brought to perfection, John says, within us only when we reproduce that love. When God, we enable him, To love through us because we are yielded and surrendered to his love. When we love others, God's love for us has reached, John says, its full effect in creating the same kind of love as his is for us. That's what it means when John says we are perfected in love. That when we reciprocate that love to one another, we love in the manner that he has loved us. The same type of love of which we are unable to love with. It is visual, it is sacrificial, and it leads us into inconvenience because it's not about self. When we do that, we love in that way then God's love for us has reached its full effect in creating the same kind of love as his in us. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing that when I fully open up my heart to love the way God loves, 
I'm perfected in that love. That doesn't mean I'm perfect, but his love is perfected. It's flowing the way that it needs to flow in and through. And it's these three truths about the love of God which John uses as motivation for our love. God is love, and the way he has loved us, and that the proof that we know him and we are in him and he is in us because that love is flowing in a practical way in and through our lives. Now, John is not saying that when we begin to love, God comes to dwell in us. That's not what God said or what John says. That when we begin to love, God comes to dwell in us. He is stating the reverse of that statement that I just made. Our love for one another is evidence of God's indwelling presence. In other words, agape is proof that we have fellowship with God. And as we move further into chapter 4, John begins to elaborate on the two statements that God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Because the unseen God who revealed himself in his son now reveals himself in his people if and when we love one another. When we love one another. In fact, we are not more like God, any more like him, when we're loving. We can't be more like him than when we're loving one another. When our love is visual. When it is sacrificial. It's not all hemmed up in me. And when it is inconvenienced, it's okay. It's okay. Because God's love does lead us into places that inconveniences self. Because it's not about me. It's about him and what he's wanting to do in and through us for his glory. So now he begins, John does, as we look at verses 13 through 16... He begins to really develop off of these two themes. The theme of the fact that God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So let's look. Verse 13. John states, by this we know that we remain in God, him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. You know, Paul even stated that, that we have been sealed by Holy Spirit. When you go and you borrow money, a lot of times you have to put a down payment down, don't you? Right? Or if you go and borrow money, say you have some land. Now, I'm terrible at this. Uh, Dan will be a whole lot better at this than I am. <laughs> but my understanding, if you've got land and you're wanting to build a house, normally you have to borrow off the land. It becomes collateral. It becomes a guarantee that I'm going to pay that loan back on my house. If not, what does the bank get? The land. (laughs) They get it all. So here, as Paul stated other places in his writings, Spirit of God is literally a seal that we are in a relationship with the Father. We are in fellowship with him. Holy Spirit does not indwell our lives because of our love, but he is the one who enables us to love, right? We can't love without the men. In fact, we can't do anything the Lord has called us to do in Christ without yielding and surrendering and seeking the empowerment of Holy Spirit every single moment of every day. Romans chapter 8, of which the ladies are beginning a study into that, is a chapter that speaks to that truth. It speaks of our life in the Spirit. He is the one who enables us to live like Christ and to manifest the reality of our Father. So Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to love. And what is important to recognize here in verse 13 and within these verses is that the grounds of our assurance as believers and the test of the reality of our Christian experiences are multiple. What I mean to say is that we cannot simply state that because a person professes true belief, or just simply loves, 
their fellow man or just simply claims to have charismatic experiences being used in the giftings that they are a true believer. Now, we go back to the context of what we're studying here in 1 John. The false teachers, they were saying they had extra knowledge from the Lord. Extra knowledge that superseded the supremacy of who Christ is, the incarnation. And so they were speaking, they had this extra knowledge, that they were enlightened by this extra wisdom, if you will. But what John is stating here is it's not just just belief, it's not just that we love our fellow man, and it's not just that we have the gifts of Holy Spirit flowing in our lives that make us a true believer, although we know we are saved through faith alone in Christ's atoning sacrifice. But what he's stating is just like James, living faith will manifest itself through love for others, and it will become the banks that the gifts of the Spirit are manifest through our lives. In other words, that's what flows. It is the combination of our faith. It is the combination of our love, agape. It is the combination of the Spirit using us in a harmonious unity that makes true Christianity. It's all working together. Our faith, our love, and the ministry of Holy Spirit working through our lives. They all go together and flow together. And John goes on to show that the test for the reality of, if you will, because he talks about Holy Spirit here in in, in verse 13, the reality of a true charismatic experience is whether those who possess them also hold to the apostolic faith. And we talked about that when we talked about the gifts in Holy Spirit. That it's not just about using the gifts. In fact, we do not measure a person's maturity and in Christ by their use of the gifts. It's the fruit of Holy Spirit that testifies of the maturity of our walk in Christ. And then the fruit literally become the banks that Holy Spirit flows through in the proper way to bring glory to God, to strengthen believers, and to cause the gospel to go forth to unbelievers. And here, John is saying, it's not about saying I've got this special word of knowledge or this special wisdom that God has imparted. It's about coming into alignment with the faith that has already been pronounced, the apostolic faith. In fact, it is Holy Spirit, John says, who enables us to see in the historic event of Jesus' death God's act of our salvation. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6, Paul stated it this way, But when the fullness of time came, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that we might redeem those who are under the law, or so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Because you are sons. Now, this is not a sexist term. I know our society right now is is really sensitive about all of that. But sons here is not a sexist term. Because it isn't really speaking of gender. It's speaking of our placement in Christ inheritance. As sons, we stand, it's talking about not gender, but our inheritance that we're receiving from him. We stand to inherit because in Christ we are sons, inheritors of the living God. God has sent his spirit into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. He stated it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by Holy Spirit. Now we know what the Jews said, accursed is anyone. In fact, the Old Testament states that. Accursed is anyone who is nailed to a cross. But no one through the Spirit can say that Jesus is accursed Neither can they say that he is Lord except through the Spirit of God. So any charismatic manifestation of the Spirit is going to testify of the reality of the apostolic faith, which does what? It speaks to the historical reality of why Jesus came. Look at verses 14 and 15 of 1 John 4. 
John says, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. So John states that anyone who acknowledges God's act in Christ, his Son, and that's the term confesses, testifies that they are part of the divine fellowship in which the Father is in the believers and the believers are in the Father. And John has his opponents in mind here. And this is confirmed by the way that he applies what he has stated in verse 14 in verse 15. Because John says it is only if a person confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, that they are joined to God in fellowship. That's the only way we can have fellowship in God, is by confessing the reality of who Christ is. The reality that He is the full manifestation of God. He is the God-man. He is fully God. He is fully human. And He came and He lived a sinless life, and He died in our stead. And He became, as John stated, the propitiation Our payment for sin, once and for all, no longer do animals have to be sacrificed, of which they continually had to be sacrificed because the Lamb of God has come and became the one perfect sacrifice in our stead. And through our confession in who Christ is as the Son of God, we are joined into fellowship with the Father. In other words, the possibility of spiritual fellowship with God depends on the historical fact of the incarnation. I know John is repeating himself because he's already stated this in each of the other chapters. And when we confess that the Father sent the Son and the Son is Jesus, we are confessing what the apostolic faith is built upon. And clearly... We can see that this is a confession which goes beyond mere recognition of just a historical fact. To acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God is not simply to make a statement about the metaphysical, in other words, this flesh. It's not just simply to make a statement about his metaphysical status, but to express obedient trust in the one who possesses such a status. It's not just a historical fact of which it is. It's that we are expressing obedient trust in him. As Paul states in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I that live, but who? Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in him, I live for him. In complete obedience. So we have seen. He says that. And the we isn't just John and the other apostles. The we is the body of Christ. The we contains us as well. Of verse 14. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. It is all-inclusive. Anyone that will put their faith in Christ can be and will be saved. Whoever confesses, John is going deeper in what he stated in verse 14, that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him, and he in God. And he closes out this line of thought in verse 16 and says, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God enables us to know. You know it? He really does. Sometimes we can struggle with his love. How many of you, I'll lift my hand, (laughs) have struggled that God could love me? Now, I know you've probably, you've heard that preached, but let's be real with one another. How many times have you struggled that your flesh or the enemy especially comes knocking at the door of your mind and of your heart. God can't love you. You see what you just did? God can't love you. How could he love you? But John says we have come to know and have believed. 
the love which God has for us. God's love is knowable. And his love keeps us believed. And he goes on and says in verse 16, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. It is so important that we remain in God's love. Remain there. Stay there. Do not let the enemy, through discouragement or whatever, remove us from God, the reality of God's love for us. Now, we mess up. I mess up. And I I pray. It's part of my daily prayer. I don't want it to become routine. In fact, I pray that too. God, don't let this become routine. But Lord, help me never to run from you in shame when I've messed up and you convict me. And Lord, never let me be like Saul that I make excuses for when I've done wrong. I don't want to do either. I don't want to make excuses for my sin And I don't want to run in shame. Instead, I want to run to your redeeming love. And I want to fully confess, as David did, I am the one who stands in need of prayer. Lord, forgive me. Because the enemy puts us in a very vulnerable place spiritually if we allow him to remove us from the knowledge and the trust of God's love. That is our safe haven, the knowledge of his love and trusting in that love. Remain. Notice that. Notice what he says there. God is love and the one who remains. That is so important. Remain in his love. Now, yes, it is true. The Bible speaks. Jesus even says, you say you love me. The proof that you love me is that you're living according to my word. That every day we're striving to live up to this by the power of Holy Spirit. That's my aim. That's my goal. That's the proof that I love. And we're to remain there. I can't earn his love. That's different. I can't earn it. God's given it. Now stay there. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean I can just go out and do whatever I want to, but I could never earn his love. You can never earn his love, okay? It's impossible. We can never be good enough. God has given it. Now, by faith, we've accepted it. Now, John says, stay there, right? You know, like when your mom and dad, they told you they had to do something, they say, no, you stay right there. (laughs) You remember? Don't move. You stay right there. And most oftentimes you moved and you found out the reason why mom and dad said to stay there. You got into something you shouldn't have got into that caused hurt, whether it be through the spanking, the whooping that you got, or something else that caused harm. And that's the thing here in verse 16. God is love. He has expressed that love to us. He has given it in And through his son, and it's his Holy Spirit that is continually to work that in our hearts and through our hearts. And John says, stay there. Remain there. Remain there. And remain in the Lord. Now, it helps, I believe, to see verse 16 as a parallel statement to what John said in verse 14. And he expresses another basic Christian conviction. The believer is sure of their faith because they have personally experienced the love of God. Personally. We have come to know his love and also to put our trust in his love. We can be absolutely sure of God's love, of its reality in our life. What's interesting is verse 16. Now, the NASB, which is what I preach from normally, this is the 2020 version, and all that means is they've just kind of updated the language. And I'm probably giving you information that you don't want to know, but there is a point to this, I promise, okay? So hang with me. Uh, The NASB 95 is 
is more of a word-by-word translation from the original text, okay? The ESV, English Standard Version, and the NSB, the New King James and uh, the King James are direct translations. The NASB is more of a word-by-word. And a lot of times, if you have ever read the NSB, the NASB, I'll say it right, 95 version, if you've read that, you look at the sentence structure and you have to go back and read it a couple of times because to try to help it to make sense. Because it's more of a word-by-word translation, and the Greeks, and the Hebrews especially, because they wrote backwards, <laughs> it's not in our sentence structure, okay? So that's what I'm trying to say. So if we take, and we have tools out there, there are tools available for us that are free, interlinear translations. You can find it online. I would encourage you to get one. If you don't, you can go online and you can find that, an interlinear translation. It is a word-by-word translation of the original text, and it is awesome to go through and study. If we take verse 16, the first part of it, in more of a literal word-by-word translation, it reads this way. And we have known and have believed the love which God has in us. And we have known and have believed the love which God has in us. And what this more literal translation shows is that John is thinking not merely of the love for us shown by God in the cross, but also of the personal experience of his love in our hearts created by Holy Spirit. Now that's significant. It's not just what God showed us on the cross. I'm visual. That's why I keep pointing back there. It's not just that. That's not only what John is getting at. John is also pointing to the personal experience of God's love in our hearts created by the indwelling of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is continuing to perfect his love in us and through us. Romans 5, 5, Paul said it this way, and hope does not disappoint Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through Holy Spirit who was given to us. Poured out. Since God is love, and it's already been been stated in verse 8, it follows that the person who lives in love lives in God and God in them. And living in love is the proof or result of living in God. Living in love, agape, is the result or the proof of living in God, John says. It is not by loving that we come into fellowship with God. That's not what he's saying. But as a result of our fellowship with God, we are enabled by God through the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit to live in love. And so John is saying, live in the love of God. He means that the true believer lives in the sphere of love, both as the object of God's love. Don't forget that. Don't let it go to your head either. Let it go to your heart. You are the object of God's love. Again, don't let it go to your head. Let it go to your heart. You are the object of God's love. And not only that, we are a channel of that love to one another. Are we remaining in his love so that it can be his love that is flowing through us? And it's Holy Spirit that enables that. Father, Lord, I I, I do pray. Lord, as we've been talking about love, and we talked about love last Wednesday And just about the visual nature of your love, the sacrificial nature of your love, and how that, Lord, your love led to great inconvenience. And that love calls us to do the same. 
Is our love visible? Is our love sacrificial? And Lord, do we allow Holy Spirit to lead us to express your love even when it's inconvenient? Lord, I pray tonight as well that, God, we would reflect on the fact that we are the object of your love. Not letting that go to our head, but go to our heart. And because we are the object of your love, that enables us to be channels of your love. Because John says we are perfected in your love when we let that love flow through our lives visibly, sacrificially, and even when it's inconvenient. Your love is perfected in us. Lord, this world needs love but not love as the world defines love Lord they need the visible expression of your love through your son and you have called us to bear witness of that but the only way we can bear witness of that is if Lord that's where we're living and that's where we're staying Oh, speak to our hearts tonight, Lord. Are you here tonight and you are struggling? Maybe because of failures. Maybe it's because of your past that you are hearing the scream of the enemy. God can't love you. Are you struggling with God's love for you tonight? I'm not saying you're an unbeliever. Even as a believer, we can get to a place that we can struggle. God loves us. If that's you tonight, you want to just lift your hand where you are and just say, Pastor, will you just pray with me? Is there anyone tonight? Amen. Anyone else? I'm just struggling with God's love for me. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Amen. 